What's going on everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to be doing my official 2020 NBA redraft, which I'll be looking at, you know, 1 through 10. Who should these teams, you know, should have taken? Should they have taken the players that they originally went with? Should they have gone a different player? You know, of course, I'm going to be looking at positional needs. How this, you know, player went throughout the season. Did they improve their stocks? Did they you know, decrease it and whatnot. So, of course, without further ado, I will be starting off with the first overall pick, which I'll actually have the Minnesota Timberwolves. And with the first overall pick, I'll actually have them selecting a Lamello Ball from the Illawarra Hawks uh, NBL Australia. Now, I think this is a, a very, very hard decision. I know some people might go, you know, keeping them with Anthony Edwards because, of course, Edwards is you know, going to be their future shooting guard. He did average about 19 points per game. His defense got a lot better. But LaMelo Ball is a complete generational talent. Like, this guy is absolutely insane. He's six foot seven, can guard, you know, one and two, and could potentially guard small forward in the future, depending on how he improves. Like, I mean, his defense has been exceptional this year. He averaged about 16 points per game, 6.1 assists, and about six rebounds on about 35% from three he was an exceptional leader again great defender and almost led the charlotte hornets team to the playoffs which was absolutely crazy you know some people might be like well how is it going to work with d'angelo russell i actually think it'd be all right considering that he was able to work with terry rosier and Devontae graham and they actually did pretty well together i'm sure they'd find a way and if it doesn't work with d'angelo russell worst scenario is you just trade russell because there's no way you can pass on a dude like Lamelo Ball, he's just way too good. Like Lamelo Ball is a legitimate generational talent, and again, I think he would have started from the get-go. They've been playing D'Angelo Russell a lot more at shooting guard this season. Been playing him a lot with Ricky Rubio, where Rubio will of course mainly have the ball in his hands, and Russell will be kind of that shooting guard. They've even been bringing Russell off the bench, which I hope doesn't continue next season because. This is absolutely silly to have a dude like that coming off the bench, especially when he's on like 30 million a year. But again, I think if they had Lamelo Ball and Russell on the same team, it would have been pretty similar to this year, except instead of having Ricky Rubio as your main point guard, you would have had Lamelo Ball and Russell would have played more and more of that shooting guard position, of course. But moving on now with the second overall pick, we do have the Golden State Warriors and they originally took James Wiseman. But in this redraft, I will have them taking Anthony Edwards. Of course, Anthony Edwards, is, it's very hard to debate whether or not he should go one or not with Lamelo. Both have had a very, very good rookie year. It's going to be really interesting to see who, of course, wins rookie of the year. But wow, I do like Anthony Edwards. Could have helped this Golden State Warriors team. Considering James Wiseman didn't even play in the playoffs, he had a lot of injuries and had a terrible rookie season. Imagine, like, adding an extra 19 points per game with Anthony Edwards. You know, not consistent three-point shooting, but considering the dude, you know, shot 520 threes this season, 33% isn't the worst. I mean, again, he will definitely improve on that, and this guy's clearly not scared to take a three. That He's literally nearly taken as much threes as he has normal two points, so... That is crazy. He has taken way more threes than I thought. 19.3 points per game, 4.7 rebounds, and 2.9 assists. Of course, his defense was a little bit inconsistent here and there, but he improved so much towards the end of the season. And could you imagine if Steph Curry actually had a little bit more help than just Andrew Wiggins and Draymond Green, and he had a player like Anthony Edwards that could score 20 points per game? That would be elite. It would be absolutely insane and a very insane kind of scenario to see them together so i think it's pretty clear that you would of course take you know anthony edwards over james wiseman practically every single day of the week now at this point if you did have the chance and again that golden state warriors team just becomes way better i think they'd definitely be in the playoffs if they were able to of course make that decision now with the third overall pick of the charlotte hornets and they originally took Ah, uh, LaMelo Ball, but in this redraft, I've actually got them taking Ty Reese Halliburton, who had a very, very good season, like, he was a, not a very high pick at all, like, I mean, he went a pick 12, some people had him in the top 5 even, he had a very, very good season, I think will probably finish 3rd in Rookie of the Year, you know, he's been very good with the Sacramento Kings, kind of worked really well as like that shooting guard that can guard 1 through 3, with De'Aaron Fox, he of course started a little bit more towards the end of the season where he started about 20 games. 
He did score 13 points per game this season, 5.3 assists and 3 rebounds on a crazy number of 40% from 3, which that was what a lot of people were critiquing him on, was him not being a very good shooter coming into the NBA, but he seemed to have proved quite a, peop a lot of people wrong with him taking 296 threes. And he did all of that in 30 minutes while playing very, very good defense and probably being a top five uh, in defense in this whole entire draft. I mean, look, Isaac Okoro, Patrick Williams, Sadiq Bay, they all did very good at defense. But Tyrese Halliburton's defense was definitely one of the best this season. If there was a defensive, you know, rookie of the year, I'd probably say Tyrese Halliburton might actually win it. Like, his defense was extremely underrated, getting about 1.3 steals per game. But again, he'd kind of just be a discount version of LaMelo Ball on this Charlotte Hornets team. This team would be nowhere near the playoffs, but getting a dude in like Tyrese Halliburton is just someone, again, you can't pass up. Look, he's not as good as LaMelo Ball, but he'll do, a, he'll do a relatively similar job in terms of being able to guard the one and two, being an okay playmaker. He's not the greatest, but still putting up some good three-point shooting numbers and some good point production here and there. Now, with the fourth over, uh, overall pick, the Chicago Bulls originally selected Patrick Williams, which was a very, very, you know, weird pick to start off with. Like, I mean... Everyone thought that he was going to be a bust and that it was just a terrible pick, but in my redraft, I've actually got them taking Patrick Williams again. Now, I know some people might take James Wiseman, but I think they've always had that plan to maybe go out and get an all-star type of center like Nikola Vucevic. So I think they'd all already have like that center position kind of locked and loaded. But if you can, you know, keep that Patrick Williams type guy, you know, a very nice... 3 and D type of dude, you know, play a small forward position, very good defender, can hit the three point, you know, very, very nice. You'd definitely retake Patrick Williams again because he just solidified his spot as a very, very good role player on the Chicago Bulls team. In his first season, he averaged 9.2 points per game, started every game, 4.6 rebounds on about 39% from three. Again, next season, I expect him to take way more threes. Very good on the mid range as well. He was 51% on two point shots. And he only played 28 minutes per game. So, again, I expect Patrick Williams to improve so much next season. Like, next season, he's going to have a very, very good year. I'm very, very intrigued to see how he's going to go. And he just fits that small forward position really, really well for the Chicago Bulls. And what they're trying to go for it needed that much... You know, they really needed defense, and he kind of added that. They needed some three-point shooting. Kind of brought that in. You know, he's getting a little bit better at it. Um, and again, the two-point shots as well. He was really nice at as well. So, again, with the fourth overall pick, I will have the Chicago Bulls sticking to the player that they originally drafted in Patrick Williams. Now, with the fifth overall pick, I have the Cleveland Cavaliers selecting James Wiseman. They originally took Isaac Okoro. Yes, they probably need that small forward position, you know, kind of filled out pretty desperately. But when you got a dude like James Wiseman, who could still be absolutely anything in the NBA, anything that he wants to be, you got to take him. I mean, there's no way the Cavs pass on James Wiseman at pick five. Look, his rookie season was not good, and a lot of people are already calling him a very big bust. He did not play in the po you know, in the playing tournament at all for the Golden State Warriors. He averaged 11.5 points per game, 5.8 rebounds um, on 31% from three on 21.4 minutes per game. His defense was absolutely terrible. But what a lot of people don't realize is this guy actually came straight from really high school to the NBA. I believe he only played about three college games. And a lot of people have been too harsh to critique players like that. You look at Darius Garland. Darius Garland pretty much came straight from high school to the NBA because he only played about five college games. Everyone was calling him a bust in his first season. Some people had him as the worst player in the NBA. Then in his second season, some people are calling him a future all-star and the future of the Cleveland Cavaliers. It's literally that short of time how much time, you know, something can change for a player. So, I think James Wiseman will have a fantastic season next year. He'll probably, hopefully, average like 14 points per game, maybe 8 or 9 rebounds. And I think, yeah, with this pick with the Cavs, you know, they get in the center. That, of course, you know, he'll probably come off the bench to start off with because of, uh, because of Andre Drummond. But because we know James Wiseman didn't have a good first season anyway, that's probably all right. Um, and again, Jarrett Allen, they would never go out and get Jarrett Allen now. And they'd probably keep that first round pick to take a, a dude in the 2021 NBA draft. You know, in, I believe, probably going to be like pick 25 or something. I think the Bucks will have. 
Uh, so originally that was going to be Cavs pick, but now again, I believe the Rockets get it this season because a part of the Jarrett Allen trade. So again, they wouldn't have Jarrett Allen, but instead would have James Wiseman. And I still believe James Wiseman will probably have a higher ceiling as a potential, you know, starting center in the NBA. So yeah, again, we'll pick number five. I do have the Cleveland Cavaliers selecting James Wiseman. Now with pick number six, oh my, this was a very, very hard pick. This is when I think it will start getting a little bit controversial. I have the Atlanta Hawks. I did not know who they should really look to take. I think it is very, very hard because I could say, hey, they should go and get an Emmanuel quickly because they need a backup guard, right? Well, no, not really at the time of the draft. They don't need a backup guard because they ended up bringing in Rondo and they ended up bringing in Chris Dunn to play backup behind, you know, Trey Young. Plus Cam Reddish, I believe, you know, even... Uh, he came off uh, the bench as well for a little bit. I know he's injured for a bit. Uh, and Kevin Herter, they have it. That's uh, that shooting guard position. Bogdan Bogdanovich as well. They just didn't need a guard. And I'm not going to have them selecting Onyeko Kongu because they barely played him and he was just behind Clint Capella. So, you know, what? I just said stuff it. We'll, we'll go best available. And I decided to have the Atlanta Hawks taking Isaac Okoro, who was originally taking a pick five. Uh, and again, at pick six, they originally took Onyeko Kongu. I just, you know, I just don't really know who they should pick here. It's a bit of a, it's a very hard one for them, but I figured, who's their backup small forward right now? Like, they've got Hunter playing small forward, you know, plays about 30 minutes per game. And then they've got, you know, Herder and Bogdan Bogdanovic playing, you know, that kind of shooting guard position and backup shooting guard position. Of course, they're kind of filling in like, like that wing. But when Cam Reddish has been injured quite a bit this season, I think it would have been good for them to have a backup small forward like, you know, Isaac Okura can play 18 minutes or so per game, bring in some nice defense, and of course, I think this would give them more overall depth than them selecting on Yaka Okongu. So now they can, you know, kind of move around. They'll have a very, very good defensive team. Like, it'd be a lot more better as well. The defense in the future will be a bit better, and I think just bringing in another wing like Isaac Okura really does make the difference for this Atlanta Hawks team. It makes up for the lack of defense, and of course, Trey Young and Kevin Hur uh, Herter do play. So again, I just thought, you know, Isaac Okura, he's best available, play some decent defense, might as well just bring him in. But with pick number seven, the Detroit Pistons originally took Killian Hayes. In this redraft, I do have them selecting Emmanuel Quickly, who he originally went, I believe it was like pick 21 or 26 or something like that to the New York Knicks. He slid really, really far, but he had a very, very good rookie season. I mean, he's 21 years of age, so he's a little bit on the older side. But in his 19.4 minutes per game, he averaged 11.4 points, 2.1 rebounds, 2 assists, 39% from 3, 40% on the, you know, 2-point shots, and pretty decent defense. Like, he's a really, really nice guard. In my opinion, of course, he's probably better to play that backup guard in the future. But when they took Killian Hayes originally, who had a terrible rookie season, I think, don't think you can complain. You start Emmanuel quickly, you know, for the time being, can guard the one and two, bring in some much needed scoring to this Detroit Pistons team. And then I think in the next year's draft, of course, they can potentially look to take a more dominant playmaking dude in like Jalen Suggs or, you know, Cade Cunningham. So I just figured Emmanuel quickly, he kind of fills in those boxes of bringing in some more scoring, some nice defense here and there. Of course, he doesn't bring in the playmaking, but again, maybe if quickly uh, played more minutes, his playmaking might have improved. But I think he's too good to pass up. He had a very good rookie season. I think he'll be one of the best six men in the NBA in little to no time. And I think he'd fit this Detroit Pistons team really well because they can get him. And then, of course, look at the future of bringing in a more, I'd say, dominant guard in terms of playmaking. So, yeah, I actually really like this pick. But again, moving on now with the eighth overall pick, the New York Knicks originally, uh, you know, they selected Obi Toppin. But in this redraft, I think they would go with Sadiq Bay. Just because now they have the knowledge that, hey, they're a really good team now and they're going to be contending. So Deek Bay kind of fits in because they don't really have that backup small forward. Like, I believe, you know, Barrett kind of started at that small forward position. And the backup small forward off the bench was, like, Kevin Knox, who literally only played 11 minutes per game. He was just not good at all. But when you have Sadiq Bay, who was one of the shining lights for the pretty bad Detroit Pistons team, I mean, he averaged uh, 12.2 points per game, 4.5 rebounds, 
38% from three, literally shot 463s, made 175 of them, and played 28 minutes. I think on the New York Knicks, he would probably play maybe about, who knows, 15 to 18 minutes per game. He can play small forward, can play power forward, uh, and again, can even start if he had injuries. He's just a really nice depth through 22 years of age as well, so he'd bring in that maturity. And again, I, I still think he could average maybe eight or nine points per off the points per game for you off the bench while bringing in some really nice three-point shooting. So that's why I have them taking Sadiq Bay over Obi Toppin. With a nice overall pick, I think the Washington Wizards, I think they did all right. I'm going to have them continually, uh, they're going to continue to take, I think, Denny of Dia. You know, Denny of Dia had a pretty interesting rookie season. You know, he didn't really play much at all. Like he had uh, some injuries here and there, you know, had some inconsistencies. But I think the future for this guy could be absolutely insane. Like in 23.3 minutes per game, he did put up 6.3 points per game, 4.9 rebounds, 1.2 assists, 53% on the two-point shots, and 31% from three. Look, they're not great overall stats, but I, I have a feeling this dude, he is the type of dude that, who knows, one day, he could maybe be like a bust, but with the ninth overall pick, you're taking a guy in Danny of Dare, who I think one day could be your future star in small four, maybe put up 15 points per game, uh, a couple of rebounds. But I think the playmaking is what's really underrated about this guy. He only averaged 1.2 assists per game because they kind of had the ball in Russell Westbrook's hands literally the whole time. And then, you know, Paul Neto, I believe, had the ball a little bit off the bench, Ish Smith as well. But I think next season will be different. I think, I, I really do think that Denny of Avdia might come in and, you know, average you four to five assists per game once he finally gets the ball in his hands and, of course, bring in some nice scoring as well. I think the ceiling is too high for this guy to not take with the ninth overall pick. Now, with the Phoenix Suns, who, at pick 10, they really did a weird pick. They took Jalen Smith, and you might be like, who? Again, you have every right to say that because he barely played this season. Such a stupid pick looking back at it. Like, they had DeAndre Ayton, who was probably going to play 30 to 35 minutes per game. You know, uh, Kaminsky, they always knew were probably going to come in anyway. He averaged about 15 minutes per game. There was no room for Jalen Smith to even play. He literally did nothing. He played six minutes per game, and he only managed to get on the court 27 times. Two points and 1.4 rebounds. It just wasn't a good pick. I think it was also like a positional thing as well. Like, they didn't really need another backup center. I think what this team desperately needs is a backup guard. Like, they've got Cameron Payne playing a bit of backup guard. They ended up bringing Torrey Craig in later in the season. I think he's played a bit of backup, you know, shooting guard. Uh, Abdul Nad uh, Nader, I think, played a little bit of uh, backup shooting guard as well at the start of the season before injury. But again, they really don't have a backup guard. So with the 10th overall pick, I'm actually taking Cole Anthony. I think this is a great pick because you bring in some really, really nice scoring, of course, for the team. He actually had a very underrated rookie season as well for the Orlando Magic, where he was able to average 13 points per game, 4.7 rebounds, 4.1 assists on 33% from three in 27.1 minutes per game. In my, in my opinion, I think his future is going to be best off the bench. I think he'll have a really, really nice role off the bench, and that's just how it will be. You know, he started literally every game pretty much except 13, but when Markel Fultz comes back, hopefully he'll recover from that, you know, ACL injury, I think you will move, you know, Cole Anthony most likely to that bench position, which will make the most amount of sense. But on the Phoenix Suns, in a redraft, wow, he would be cool. You know, I still think campaign would be all right, but he would guard probably a little bit more of that maybe shooting guard position. But you bring in Cole Anthony, he'll play about 15 minutes for you off the bench and maybe even score you about eight points or something like that. He would be really nice. Instead, they've got like Torrey Craig playing a little bit of backup minutes of shooting guard now. Javon Carter as well played 12 minutes per game. Langston Galloway, I think, even played a little bit. He played 11 minutes per game in 40, you know, uh, in 40 games. So it'd just be, yeah, bringing in Cole Anthony, bringing in a young guard to come off the bench. I think it's the best case scenario. Definitely a lot better than them taking Jalen Smith with a 10th overall pick. But of course, I'd very much like to hear all of your thoughts and opinions on this down below. Of course, don't forget to subscribe 
to my gaming channel and my IRL slash long channels. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already for all the latest NBA content and NBA news. Of course, don't forget to check out my podcast as well if you haven't already, which I'll link in the description down below. And comment your thoughts and opinions on my NBA mock draft. Do you guys agree with it? Do you guys disagree? What would be your NBA mock draft? Like, who would you guys take maybe instead? Of course, I'd very much like to hear all of your thoughts and opinions on this down below. But of course, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for the latest NBA content and NBA news. And I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.